Her parents would walk in on her as, or so they thought, she was making love to some strange man. But turns out it was something much, much darker than that. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Jodine Saren. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> <laughs> Jodine, who would actually go by Jody to her family, she was born on November 21st, 1967 in Los Angeles, California, but her family would very soon move out of state. The family would actually move to Walton Hills, Ohio, which is where Jody spent the majority of her life. She would graduate from Bedford High School in 1986. And then sometime after that, she would end up moving with her family back to Southern California, this time specifically to Carlsbad. And this case kind of hits home to me a little bit because I was born in Escondido, California, but I lived the majority of my young life in Oceanside, which is like five, 10 minutes from Carlsbad, depending on you know where you are. Carlsbad is home of the very first Legoland amusement park, a place I have never been to and probably never will. Now, Carlsbad is considered a very, very affluent city. It's actually one of the top 20 wealthiest cities in the United States. I like to basically call it the Scottsdale, Arizona of Southern California. Now, as of right now, it's it's kind of like right in the middle in terms of being like, in terms of safety of the city. But back when this case took place, Carlsbad was perceived as a very safe place to live. But sorry, anyway, back to Jody. <laughs> Jody was someone who absolutely adored uh, flowers and she loved to make like floral arrangements. And there in Carlsbad, in that area, flowers were very plentiful. There was just something about them that she felt brought so much beauty to the world and so much joy and happiness and smiles to people's faces. Eventually, she would actually get a certificate in floral design. Jody was definitely an animal lover. Uh, in particular, she really loved horses. In fact, she had her own horse, this pretty little white horse. Uh, and she named him Sam, and she loved to ride him. She loved horseback riding. She also loved to ice skate. She loved to bike. Um, she loved doing crafts. She was a very, uh, very involved person. She just loved doing things. She loved getting out and just enjoying life as every day came by. She also loved the beach, and she just so happened to live next to some of the most beautiful beaches in the country. Jody was also um, a special needs individual. She had some uh, mental impairments. I'm not exactly 100% sure what they were, but she was considered uh, very high functioning, meaning she could work, she had her own place, you know, she could live on her own. Um, she still needed help with some things like driving she could not do. Um, and her parents, even as she was, you know, at the time of the story, she's about 39 years old, um, her parents were still very involved in her life and they would check on her every single day. Um, they would call her at least twice a day. They would stop by her apartment um, or her condo. Um, they had a spare key to her place just because, you know, there were times where she needed help. Her family would say that her, you know, mental impairments really didn't hinder her much. They didn't slow her down. They didn't... Uh, caused trouble in her life and she very much embraced it. Uh, she had a large circle of friends within the disabled community that she loved dearly. So between her community and her family, especially her parents, Jody was really well taken care of and she was clearly very, very loved. But her life would come to an unfortunate and very sudden end on February 14th, 2007, Valentine's Day. She lived in her own condo. She had no roommates. And like I said, it was very routine for her parents to at least call her a couple of times a day, uh, specifically more in the morning and then again before bedtime, just to make sure everything was good, but also just to catch up with her. By the 
Late evening of February 14th, her parents had had like their own, you know, Valentine's date night. Uh, they had gone to dinner, they had then gone to a movie, um, and the movie let out sometime around 10 p.m. And Jody's father, um, his name uh, was Art, uh, he realized that they hadn't heard from Jody literally all day long, um, and that was very unusual. So Art and, you know, his wife Lois, uh, would just take a quick stop by Jody's condo to just, just make sure everything was okay. When her parents walked up to her condo, the porch light uh, was on, um, and it looked like there was lights on on the inside, but they couldn't tell for sure. So they knocked on her door um, to no answer. They started to call her name, no answer. They knocked again, nothing. So they would turn the doorknob, and the door was unfortunately locked. But uh, like I said, they had a spare key to her apartment in case of an emergency. So Arch took out the key and he unlocked the door and tried to open it. Still locked. The security chain was uh, hooked up, but there was that crack where you can kind of like see into the apartment. And then at that point, they can confirm like, you know, all the lights were on inside. Um, it appeared that Jody had been there at some point very, very recently. Uh, but they didn't see her and they didn't see signs of anyone. So they called out her name again and again they get nothing, no response whatsoever. Art then makes the decision because what if something is wrong? So he makes a decision to bust the door in. So he, he runs into the door to get the chain lock loose and it works. He busts the door open. So her parents walk inside her condo. Again, everything seems normal. There's no like unusual sounds happening. Everything is just perfectly fine, it seems. Once again, they call out her name. Once again, they hear nothing. They're kind of assuming at this point, okay, maybe Jody's just in the shower. She's taking a really long shower and that's why she doesn't hear us. Okay, fine. And then they hear a sound coming from Jody's bedroom. So Art would go to her bedroom door and kind of quietly call out her name and he got no response. He did a nice little knock on the bedroom door. Again, nothing. So he decides to crack open the door and he slowly opens it and Jody's parents are taken aback. They are very, very surprised because what they see is a man uh, on top of their daughter and it, it appears that they are having sexual intercourse um so his parents or her parents are like oh shit sorry and so they like kind of bolt out of the room um and kind of go down the hallway a little bit um and at that point because her parents are so like oh my god frazzled they say they basically scream to the man like get your stuff get your clothes on and please leave the condo please now um so they kind of walk to the hallway give him a few minutes to collect his things and leave. Obviously, both parents are extremely embarrassed at this point, and they have to imagine that Jody is equally as embarrassed. But Art and Lois also kind of quickly realize, why didn't Jody make any sound when they walked in? Why didn't she scream? Why didn't she do anything or react? So, at any rate, her parents wait kind of down the hallway, um, and again, they give him a few minutes to leave. But they realize they don't see anyone leaving. They don't hear any sounds. Nothing is happening, it appears. So this time, Art goes back to her room and he, this time, you know, again, knocks aloud, Jody, we're coming in. We want to make sure everything's okay. So then they wait a second and then they open the door again. And this time they're met with something horrific. The man, he was gone. Jody was lying very motionless on the bed. They called out to her, Jody didn't respond. They walked up to her and kind of like tried to like rustle her a little bit and she wasn't reacting or responding and they noticed that her skin felt very cold. Art realizes Jody's not breathing. Um, and then as he kind of sort of collects his thoughts, they both notice that she has bruises and uh, injuries to her body, like very bad, um, as if she was beaten. So he panics and he gives her CPR, hoping that might resuscitate her, but it doesn't work. 
Jody, their 39-year-old daughter, is dead. Absolutely devastated, they call police, and an ambulance arrives, and they confirm that Jody is, uh, she is deceased. The medical examiner who would arrive on the scene would make this story so much worse. Jody was very cold to the touch, and they were able to determine that she had likely been dead for at least a few hours. Meaning that when her parents walked in on what they thought was her having intercourse with this man, that was not the case. Uh, he was having intercourse with her dead body. Which, I mean, I, 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 I can't even imagine being in their position, having walked in on that, not realizing what it was, and then later realizing what it was, and just sort of like that insane level of like helplessness and just devastation to have to experience that with your like your own daughter. The police investigation would begin immediately. Um, the first thing they they check for is how did this person get inside? All of the windows were closed. All of them had screens. Um, all of the windows were locked. Um, there was only one door in and out of the condo itself. That was the front door. Other than where Art kicked in the, the chain lock, there was no signs of forced entry. So they had to come to the conclusion that Jody let this man inside her apartment. So did she know him? Um, her parents got kind of a decent look at him, but not really. But they thought they recognized the man as someone within her uh, circle of disabled friends. Um, now, police would later uh, check this man's alibi. They would also check, you know, compare his DNA because DNA in their investigation, they realized, was left behind um, with in Jody. So they had the man's body fluids. Um, but it did not match the man that Arch thought it could have been. So that man was completely cleared. But at any rate, Jody must have let the man in, but this is not confirmed even to this day. So the exact um, scenario in which the man got inside the apartment is really unknown. But Jody did have um, a very charitable, very friendly demeanor. She was very hospitable, so it's very possible he could have said something to convince her to let him in the apartment. Now, how did he get out without the parents seeing or hearing anything? The only thing they can come to the conclusion was that since he did not leave through her bedroom window, because again, it was locked, the screen door was on, um, where the parents were waiting after they walked in and what they did, they were kind of in a corner of the condo where they could not see the front door and they could not see Jody's bedroom door. So this man must have been just incredibly bold and just darted out of her room and out of the front door of the condo and then fled. This would later be confirmed when police were questioning witnesses in the, in the condos. Um, and one lady said, a neighbor said, she saw a man running from Jodine's apartment and just bolted down this embankment and fled. But unfortunately, she did not get any kind of good look at the man's face um, at all. And that kind of makes it even more terrifying that this man who had murdered their daughter was now in this condo with these two people alone, not knowing, like, they didn't know he, this was her murderer. And that, that's just very scary to, like, think about. Her parents would also walk around the condo to for police to see if anything was missing. And nothing was gone. There was nothing stolen. Her purse, her wallet, any jewelry she had was all left out in the open and not a single thing was taken. So they don't believe this was robbery. So ultimately they concluded that the motive behind this this murder was uh, sexual in nature. And like I said just a bit ago, they did find DNA um, on Jody that was not hers. It was obviously the man's DNA. They ran it through the system, but unfortunately it did not hit anyone. Um, no one in the system would match the DNA. 
police would uh, question all of her neighbors um, and all of the circle of friends she had. They would question every person in her life um, and they got nothing. There was, she had no enemies. She was not in any kind of bad relationship. She didn't have any jilted exes. She, her coworkers, all in good spirits. Everything in her life was great. Um, she literally had no one negative. Um, so this had to be one of the worst types, a random murder. Those are the hardest ones to track down and the hardest ones to find. Especially a man who left behind almost nothing other than his DNA, but there were like no, you know, hair samples. There were no, there was no, no shoe prints, foot impressions, fingerprints, nothing. They had nothing. So it looked like if they were never going to get hit on DNA, this was never going to get solved. So ultimately the DNA had to play the role of hero in this case. And thankfully it would. It would be 10 years after Jody's murder. So now we're in 2017. As you all know, fans of, you know, true crime stories, um, DNA technology is constantly advancing. And we are now at a level where you could plug DNA into a system and it could give you like a, a composite of the person that likely would match that DNA. And that's pretty much exactly what police would do. You know, they would run the DNA from her case every chance they could, but it never matched anyone. Um, so what they did, they went to Parabon Nano Labs, um, which what that was doing at the time was it was like this new digital technology that once you put in the DNA, it would create a digital image of the of a person, a generic person, um, and it would base it would know essentially what if they were male or female. It would know their skin color. It would know their uh, you know their heritage, their ancestry, their eye color, their hair color. It would know like if they had a what the shape of their face was. It's very uh, cool actually how it all works. And you might, you might remember that it was this technology or something very similar to it that helped eventually catch the Golden State Killer um, not too long ago. So when they plugged in the DNA from Jodine's case, it would say that it belonged to a man in his 30s to 40s. He was of European descent. He was likely very light-skinned or white. And it produced an image. And this image would be circulated around um, the media uh, and just sort of everywhere, um, especially in the area of where Jodine lived, um, also where she may have worked, just in case maybe anyone would recognize the person. And eventually someone did. In November of 2018, a witness would come forward to say that this image has a resemblance to someone I knew back then um, and his name was David Mabrito. In 2007, he was vaguely known kind of by police. Um, he was considered, I guess, more along the lines of a transient at the time. He was 38 years old. Um, he was white, so he was in the age range, skin color. He, uh, he was of European descent, so everything was matching. So, great. Let's go get him. Let's bring him in for questioning, and let's test his DNA. They couldn't do it. This is because in 2011, right around the anniversary of the murder of Jodine uh, Sarin, uh, David would take his own life. So he was deceased. Police would look into his file and realize, oh, well, we, he was arrested at one point and they collected his DNA. Perfect. Well, that DNA was gone. It was somehow lost. Shit. Well, now what do we do? We need to be able to at least confirm it was him so that we can either move on from him or say this is our guy and we can close the case and give her family some closure. Well, they found out that uh, David had an ex-wife um, who they had a son with together. Um, the son was now, at the, at the point of this end of the investigation, he was a, a teenager. Um, and the wife and the son fully cooperated with police. Um, they asked if they could take a sample of the son's DNA 
because they can get a partial match if you know if david was the one to do it then the son's dna would be a partial match and they were like absolutely do what you need to do here you go um and so they got a sample of the son's dna they ran it against the crime scene bingo it was him um so it would be confirmed that Jodine's assaulter and murderer was David Mabrito. And it should be noted that the uh, ex-wife and son had nothing to do with him in 2007 when this happened. Um, they weren't really in each other's lives very much at, the point, at that point. So this was a complete and utter shock and surprise to them just as much as anyone else. Um, and, but unfortunately, from what I understand, they got some harassment from people in the community, but it, which was completely um, unwarranted. But I guess people were taking their anger out on someone, but it was undeserved. Um, they had absolutely no connection to this whatsoever. So even though the bad guy didn't go to prison and didn't face justice, at least Jodine's parents and her friends, her family, at least they got closure and they found out who it was that did this. And now they know that this man will never do anything like this to anyone ever again. This is a case that shows you how amazing technology is in the realm of forensics, true crime in general. Um, like I said, it's constantly evolving. DNA is always advancing. Um, these super intelligent people can do all these really smart people things. And, you know, they can solve crimes now with, like, the teeniest, idiotiest bit of, of evidence. Like, a tiny drop of blood, and boom, you're convicted now. Um, it's, it's cool. I, I, it's, it's evolving so much that hopefully, eventually, this, this really lowers the overall crime rate. Fingers crossed. But, but people will still do shitty things, no matter if they know they can get caught really easily, because... In the end, people will always be people. But yeah, like, a skin cell flakes off of your fingertip and it gently falls onto something in the crime scene, or a little one single strand of hair, boop, and it flutters down on top of, like, your victim. Boom! DNA, done. You're arrested. Gone forever. Uh, it's just cool. I think that's really cool. But that is it for this case today. It's kind of a shorter one, um, but... You know, it is what it is. We had a good, we had a good conclusion in the end. So, um, if you want to see more uh, cases from me in significantly shorter form, like three minutes, you can head on over to my TikTok page, um, where I have well over two thousand stories that I've told over there, and I continue to add more stories to it. Um, so yeah, please give me a follow. I have about two point seven million followers. Uh, I'm trying to get all of you guys over here as well, so that I can like cross-contaminate both you know what i mean contaminate get it no okay um if you have a case you would like me to cover either on here or on tiktok and by the way the way i decide is if if there's a lot of information on the case then i can do it on here if there's like very minimal info i'll do it over on tiktok so it just depends but go to my link tree which is in my uh my uh description below and click on, when you're in the link tree, click on the crime or case list and scroll through it. It's alphabetical for the most part. Um, or if you want to search, if you're on a computer, hit control F, then type in the name. If you're on a phone, hit the three dots at the top, then scroll down to say where it says find and replace, type in the name. If the name does not show up, then send me a quick email to Mikey at truecrimer.com. Just send me like the the name of the case, where it happened, when it happened, just basic information, and I can add it to the list. But please check the list first. I get inundated with a lot of emails, and so many of them are duplicates that are already on my list, so just please, yeah. Okay, and then lastly, if you want to support me in any way, we do sell merch also in the link tree in the description below. We sell t-shirts and hoodies. We sell mugs and a wine glass and other things. Um, we're on Etsy right now, but eventually we'll be moving to another site with kind of updated merch a little bit. Um, Adam, who makes all my merch, his info is below in the, in the description as well. He's amazing. Um, he will ship anywhere in the world. So he will ship internationally. Just be aware you're paying kind of a high shipping fee, unfortunately, but he will. So 
All right, that is it for today's case. Uh, I shall see you for the next one. And until then... Cut off now, true crime. <coughs>